Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Conegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is Man Behind the Curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IGMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Don. Great to be here. So today we have our IHMC colleague, Dr. Kayleen Lavin, a research scientist who investigates the molecular mechanisms by which the body adapts and reacts to stressors, such as exercise, training, and aging. And Kayleen came on board IHMC last year and is known for her use of computational biology techniques to understand and also improve human health, performance, and resilience. So she is also interested in exercise as a countermeasure for a range of disease conditions, including neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's disease. And today we're going to talk to her about some of her most recent work, which examined the molecular effects of exercise in skeletal muscle and in people with Parkinson's. We also talked to Kayleen about her recent paper that took a really comprehensive look at the current literature surrounding the molecular and cellular processes underlying exercise-induced benefits and adaptations in humans. The paper appeared earlier this year in Comprehensive Physiology, and the paper was titled State of Knowledge on Molecular Adaptations to Exercise in Humans. And Kayleen is a graduate of Georgetown University, where she earned a bachelor's degree in biology, and she earned a master's in sports nutrition and exercise science from Mary Wood University in Pennsylvania, and her PhD in human bioenergetics from Ball State University in Indiana. Before we get to our interview with Kayleen, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear you review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker Low Carbo. The <laughs> review is titled Love It. The review reads, The intermittent fasting interview was fascinating. I'm hooked after listening. Thank you for a smart, intriguing podcast. Well, thank you so much to Low Carbo, and thank you to all of our other STEM Talk listeners who've helped STEM Talk become such a great success. Okay, and now on to today's interview with Dr. Kayleen Lavin. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Hi, welcome to STEM Talk. I'm your host, Don Kernagas, and joining us today is Kayleen Lavin. Kayleen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. And also joining us is Ken Ford. Hello, Don, and hello, Kayleen. So, Kayleen, I understand that you grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I also understand that you were really into music. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. As a kid, it was just sort of one of the many hobbies that my mother was carting us around to seemingly every night. Choir, church choir, chorus, that kind of thing, along with a couple physical activity, you know, hobbies as well. But I would say that was the predominant one that really stuck with me as a kid. By the time you reached high school, I hear you became more interested in competitive swimming and started spending lots of time training. Yeah, is that right? Absolutely. High school swimming is one of the most rigorous high school activities, I would say. I think we were doing something on the order of 12 workouts a week in combination with competitions, which we would sometimes have two or three meets on top of that. So, you know, you either love it or leave it, I guess, with competitive swimming. And I loved it. And I think it was a great character building activity and also really helped me figure out the type of exercise that I do best, which turned out to be sort of long duration, lower intensity. I was always in the events that lasted more than two minutes because anything less than that, I just couldn't, you know, rev up the engine enough to get the power to do it fast enough. So I was nowhere near competitive in some of the shorter events. And I learned that about myself through the process of swimming. Hmm. Yeah, you and I are in the same boat, Kayleen. I was a distant swimmer as well, and it was not so great at the sprinting. So <laughs> I'm right there yeah. with you. <laughs> it's one or the other for sure. Yeah. So you were an excellent student growing up, but it wasn't until your junior year of high school that you became interested in science. Is that right? And also, was it a teacher that you had that influenced you? I know a lot of our STEM Talk guests have had teachers that have influenced them in that space. Absolutely. The teacher makes all the difference. And no matter what you're learning, whether it's academics or otherwise, somebody that shares their passion with you that way just really can be infectious. I think it was around my sophomore year, if I'm not mistaken, that I took a biology class with Suzanne Fitzsimmons uh, at my high school. And she 
she just, you know, had that passion. She had that energy that really made biology this whole world. And it made it really interesting to me. And I think that that was sort of the point at which I thought that there was one subject that stood out among the rest. Up to then, I just kind of liked everything. I guess my favorite mm. subject prior to that was probably math. Science never really did much for me till, t- till I took biology. So after you graduated, you headed off for Georgetown University. So what led, your, led you to decide to go to Georgetown? They were really generous with regard to a scholarship that they offered me based on the position that I graduated in my high school class. So I, you know, really couldn't turn that down. It, it just sort of seemed like that was the way that the path was leading because of that opportunity. So that that's where I went. And I think that it was the right decision in terms of science and in terms of where the opportunities, the doors that it opened for me. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's all, that's all I really have to say about that. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. And so when you set foot on the Georgetown campus, did you know that you wanted to major in biology? Yeah, I had predetermined my major well before signing up or well before applying. That's going way back, trying to remember going through those applications. But I I definitely knew at that point that I wanted to study biology. I think I also knew I did not want to be a doctor in the medical sense, Um, you know, actually seeing patients that way. For a while, I thought mm-hmm. I might want to be a veterinarian, but uh, that that sort of fell off as I thought about all the implications of what that job would entail. And I just knew that I, biology was interesting, and I thought that that would be something worth following. So, yeah, I definitely knew before I got there, I knew they had a good biology program, and and it worked out, I guess. It seems that a turning point for you might have been when you became part of the Howard Hughes program at Georgetown, which led you to gain experience working in a lab environment. Uh, If that's the case, could you talk a little about that? Sure. A Howard Hughes program at Georgetown was a really great opportunity for undergrads like myself at the time to have lab experience, which is something a lot of undergrads, now they probably get it often because I know it's become a lot more competitive. But at the time, it was really unique. So there were about eight or nine students that were offered the opportunity to just pick a lab, spend about 10 weeks there over the summer. And they they, they took care of us. So they gave us a stipend. They put us up in a townhouse there right on the streets of Georgetown, which is a really neat area, kind of historic feeling. And um, we would have regular journal clubs, which was the first time that I had to read a proper scientific paper a year out of high school and being thrown into, you know, a neurology article was totally overwhelming. I remember having to pull up a, a dictionary as I was reading and in every other line I was highlighting and trying to understand what each word meant because it was just so overwhelming. And uh, but that's exactly the point. They tried to kind of push us into the deep end, but we weren't alone because we had that little community of other students and we had older students who were in their second, third and, and sometimes fourth years of undergraduate research. And then, of course, you know, the team of advisors was really solid. So it created a good first exposure to what research really looked like and the type of situation where unlike a lab that's part of a class where you would go in, you'd know what you were going to find and you'd expect you write your lab report and move on and do something different the next week. We sort of got a feel for what it was like to go in and you didn't know what the answer was going to be. And the lab report was, you know, maybe you write a paragraph or something that ended up in a real publication. So it was cool to see that. And it felt more real world and more wild west at the same time. I can imagine. It sounds really cool. Yeah, it sounds like a great experience. And and also as an undergrad, you transitioned from competitive swimming to doing a lot more running. And you actually ended up running a marathon and half marathon and became quite passionate about running as as well as other types of exercise. And we understand that your father is an avid marathoner. So is that what gave you the incentive to start signing up for marathons in the first place? My father has been running since I think he was 12 years old. So he grew up in Scranton, as well. He spent the majority of his childhood there and has lived there for most of his, and all of his adult life. But he tells a story that my grandfather took him to the top of a hill and left him there and said, I'll meet you at home. And <laughs> so he ran home. And I don't know how far it was, miles at least. And then it just sort of became a thing that it was part of him. It was, you know, he woke that part of himself up and that he is a runner. It's his identity. And here, 50 years later, it's still his identity. I didn't grow up running, obviously. Um, I didn't even really grow up doing much of anything physical. But when I did get into running, he hadn't been doing it a whole lot at that point. He actually was sort of in the phase of life where a lot of life was happening and he wasn't 
running regularly. He would do it every so often. But I think that actually me getting into it independently sort of reignited it in him. And when I expressed the interest to do a half marathon, which there was one in Washington, D.C., you know, we were just it just sort of seemed right. Okay, let's do it together. So we did. That was the national half marathon, which was really beautiful. It happened at 7 a.m. right along the National Mall. So run by all the monuments as the sun is coming up. It was really cool. And it was cool to do it with him, too. And I remember it was a dual lap course. So if you did the marathon, it was two laps of the same 13 miles versus for us, we only had to do one. And I remember thinking, oh, God, can you imagine you see everybody finishing and you still have to go and do another lap? But at the same time, something in me was like, well, that would be kind of cool. And so when the fall came around, we both signed up for a marathon back in Scranton, which is called the Steamtown Marathon. It was ranked in runner's world as like one of the top 10 marathons in the country at the time because of the course. It was a point to point course. So it's kind of nice. You see a lot of different things. You don't have to do two loops of the same thing. You can actually see, um, you know, more of the area. And just the beautiful foliage in Pennsylvania at that time of year makes the whole thing just really special. You start up in the mountains and you just kind of watch yourself descend into uh, downtown Scranton. So we did that one a couple years in a row. And in training for all these things that, you know, running is a really interesting activity because you spend a lot of time with yourself. And so you spend a lot of time in your own mind figuring out what your limitations are. You might spend that time thinking about a problem that you're facing academically. I used to do that a lot because I always went for a run after my calculus two class. And so I remember a lot of times running would just help me stop thinking about math, which is nice. But in a way, you know, sometimes answers to problems come to you when you're out there. You also spend a lot of time just thinking about, you know, can I actually do this? Can I keep going? Like my legs feel pretty heavy. And, and, you know, you reach those barriers and you overcome them. And so that's personally, I think I learned a lot about myself that way. So I became pretty addicted to it. And um, it's a dangerous addiction in the sense that it's a pretty, you know, intense activity. There's a lot of muscle loading that comes with it. There's a lot of skeletal loading that comes with it. And at that time, I wasn't studying exercise, and so I didn't appreciate that, and so I was injured a lot. I learned a lot about um, having to dial it back, having to cross-train, having to balance myself so that I could keep doing the type of thing that I loved to do. But absolutely, um, it was a a wonderful thing to do and to be able to share it with my dad, and now my whole family uh, does it. So for it to be an activity that we can do together is, is really quite special. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, we, um, you know, I, I run a lot, not fast, but <laughs> we, our, our family does a, a fair bit of racing together as well. And, and obviously we have a really solid friend group that does it too. And like you said, there's that blend of, you know, being by yourself versus being with others and pushing yourself. And I, I still remember to this day when I was all the way through grad school, um, every Sunday morning I went and ran this one trail called the Company Mill Trail here in Raleigh. And that was my way to sort my head from right. the previous week and into the next week. And so it was kind of my, my time alone. So I, I could definitely identify with that. And I love that you did that with your father as well. So that's Absolutely. cool. Absolutely, yeah. I run of being chased. <laughs> <laughs> Bears and other creatures. Oh, no thanks. <laughs> So Kayleen, as graduation loomed on the horizon, you knew that you wanted to pursue a master's and even perhaps a PhD. And and you also knew that you wanted to get into research, but you weren't quite sure what you wanted to study. And so I understand that faculty advisor noticed how passionate you you became about running and exercise and offered you a suggestion. Is that right? Absolutely. That was my advisor at the time, Dr. Joseph Neal, who was the leader of the Hughes program. He was actually the primary faculty advisor. And so I had worked in his lab for all the time that I was there. And, uh, I think I used to run by his house. And so that was probably where he's, why he saw me so often <laughs> and, and knew that I was always out there. And uh, when it came time for me to graduate and try to find a program to go to, you're exactly right. He was advocating that I had chased something that I was really passionate about and not just to go and do it because it's what I thought I should do, which is a little bit of the vibe that I got. You know, it's, it's okay, time to graduate, time to move on. What are you going to do now? And everybody around me was going into cancer research and cell biology and, and sort of more typical things. And I sat down and I thought, okay, I don't know what mine is. There's not a specific disease I want to find the answer for. There's not a specific organism that I want to study. At the time, I was in a, a lab that used mouse Uh, mouse models to research models of schizophrenia and chronic pain. And I sort of knew that really wasn't what I wanted to always do, but I also understood the value of it for the science. So anyway, um, I, you know, did my homework, went online, graduateschools.com or whatever it was at the time back in 2011. And um, 
And I found out that there were areas that actually studied exercise. And that was completely novel to me. I never really thought about it. But um, it seemed like kind of the obvious thing to do, given that I was, you know, thinking about exercise all the time, doing exercise all the time. And I really believed that it was the answer for a lot of chronic conditions. I hoped it was. At least that's part of the reason I was doing it. I knew it made me feel good mentally, but I did believe in it for the sake of physical health, too. And so I thought, well, that would be pretty cool to figure out why that works. After earning your bachelor's degree, you headed back home to Scranton to work on a master's at Marywood University. Marywood is a small Catholic university. What led you to choose uh, Marywood? Was it because it was in Scranton, or was there more to it than that? A little bit more to it than that. I had lined up a master's position at UMass Amherst. Actually, I was considering going there to study cardiovascular biology. Makes sense, right, in the context of all the running I was doing. But uh, unfortunately, their funding fell through. And it happened to me at a time that I was taking time away from running. And I was, you know, that puts you in a bad mental place anyway. And so it was a little bit overwhelming to start to understand, like, okay, this is how science works, right? If there's not funding available, there's not a position available. And so that it just wasn't going to happen anymore. And so I did have to scramble a little bit to try and find somewhere to go. And of course, you know, why not in my own backyard? Marywood was about two or three miles away from where my parents lived at the time. I grew up knowing it was there and they had a human physiology lab that seemed to do kind of exactly what I wanted to do. And so there was no reason to walk away from it just because it was close. Um, in fact, it was kind of nice to return back to Scranton and, and feel like it was a little bit more of where I was, you know, part of me. So I think that worked out well. Um, it definitely, in a way, it felt like sort of a step in a, maybe a sidestep or maybe a bit of a step back, but I don't really think it was now mm. in the overall scheme of things. No, it sounds mm. like a good fit. And you decided you wanted to earn a PhD in exercise science, and this led you after Marywood to Indiana, where Ball State University is located. And Ball State's well known for human performance. Uh, it's a strength of Ball State. It's a longstanding program. Is that what attracted you to Ball State? Uh, how, how did that happen that you went to Ball State for your PhD? I think that I didn't have an appreciation for how longstanding their program was when I applied. I think that revealed itself to me once I had gotten there. But at the time, I was, you know, same process. Just started looking for places that appealed to me and reading up on their websites and understanding a little bit of the work that they had done. And I just happened to be really fortunate to be offered that position at Ball State. And then once I was there, I think then I thought, okay, wow, this is kind of a big deal. But I, I didn't have an appreciation for it up front. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe I would have been too intimidated to even try. So we're going to go back just a little bit, um, Kayleen, and talk about when you're swimming in the high school swim team. And mm -hmm. this is definitely a shared experience um, that, that we've had. <laughs> so you used to have to do what, what are called no breath laps as part of your training program, which, you know, is kind of a love-hate relationship. Oh, no, you remember with those, them fondly. Right? Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so can you tell our, our audience what no breath laps are, first of all? Of course. So a typical competitive swimming pool will be 25 yards from end to end. And the objective of this lap is just to swim the whole way without taking a breath. So just keep your face in the water the whole time. It takes around you know, 15 to 20 seconds to make it from one end to the other. So it's not necessarily that long. But what gets hard is when you stack them on top of each other and then you're taking less rest at the walls. So, you know, your oxygen availability is going down. You're feeling a little hypercapnic as the CO2 builds up in your lungs. And if you do 20 or so of these in a row... It, uh, it's a really unpleasant feeling in the pit of your stomach. <laughs> and elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I love this. So, so uh, now that you are in the human performance lab at Ball State, you began to wonder, were all those horrible no breath laps I had to do in high school really worth it? And so I love this, that you set up a study to examine the effects of controlled frequency breath swimming on pulmonary function. So can you tell us about that study design and then also some of the key takeaways from that study? Of course. So this was actually before I had gotten to Ball State. This was my master's thesis at Marywood. But um, while I was trying to design a thesis, the whole objective there is, okay, what's a question you want to answer? And so having experienced the the glory of these no breath laps, I really wanted to, to understand if there was sort of a mechanistic reason why we had to go through them, if it was just a character building thing. Because no <laughs> doubt about it, you have to be mentally strong to keep making yourself do that, even though it feels so bad. 
And so I had the chance to to develop the study, as you said, and compare what we called at the time controlled frequency breath swimming to more open, giving people access to breathing as often as they wanted. Um, we couldn't ask people to try and hold their breath the whole way because they were novice swimmers. And it's it's a really technical thing that we didn't think was necessarily appropriate for that group. But the main objective was just to have people do that for a couple sessions a week and over the course of time just to see if it actually changed the way that they were exchanging oxygen within the tissues of the body on, on a global level by just looking at lung function. So that was what we did just before and after the training. We measured lung function. We measured running economy, which is just, you know, how much energy does it take to cover a given distance running? And we measured their swimming performance, too, with regard to, I think it was 150-yard lap or something like that, just to see how fast they could swim and um, compare the group that was doing the no breath style laps or the limited breathing style laps to more of an open availability oxygen uh, model. And um, it really interestingly, the group that was doing the controlled frequency breath swimming actually had improved lung function with regard to, I think it was minimum inspiratory pressure. So a little bit probably better at keeping the air in maybe. And they also had improved running economy, which would sort of suggest that they got more efficient on land, even though the exercise they were doing was in the water. Kenley, were these uh, well-trained uh, people or a relatively exercise-naive population? They were relatively exercise-naive. I think everybody was sort of recreationally active. Nobody was a highly trained swimmer, though, which I think is an important distinction, especially because of the nature of that activity and how unique it is. You know, swimming is really the only sport where you're, you're totally out of your element. So I think that that was um, that was by design. Of course, we thought that that would be the best chance to see those adaptations right. take place. Right. But since I left Marywood, my advisor at the time, Gerald Zavorsky, left Marywood, too, and he moved on to Georgia State University where he built on that study using highly trained swimmers. And so he could make the intensity a little bit different. I, I can't quite remember what he found with the results of his study, but it was neat to me to see that he took that as a model and then built on it with a newer question. Right. Like that, how science works. Yep. And that question springs to mind automatically from your study. <laughs> right. And that's the way it should work. As you mm -hmm. said, Ball State was really a the right place for you. Uh, also because it set you up in a sense for your postdoc work at the University of Alabama Birmingham Center for Exercise Medicine. Could you tell us about that and how you transitioned? Of course. While I was at Ball State, Dr. Marcus Bauman came down to, or came up, I guess, geographically from Alabama to, uh, to Muncie to give a lecture and to interface with my advisors and the directors of the Human Performance Lab, Scott and Todd Trappy. They've been friends for a long time, and they were working together to put together a grant, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later, one of the larger consortiums that was developed across the country. But at the time, he came up just to give a lecture, and so I, I met him then. And of course, I was aware of his work because I was studying inflammation and skeletal muscle. And Marcus is one of the leaders in, in the field with regard to that in the context of exercise. And when it came time to look for a postdoc, I knew there was a good relationship already between him and my advisors. And I knew that he was doing really solid work. But I also knew that he was doing it in sort of a clinical sense. Whereas at Ball State, we were often studying the three populations that they would always say were astronauts, <laughs> aging, and athletes, uh, which is a really cool and varied group of individuals to be looking at. But it doesn't include chronic conditions, chronic disease, which is something that obviously is important, right? It touches some part of every population and is becoming more and more of a problem by the day. And so I knew when it was time for me to look for a postdoc that that would have been a really interesting area to sidestep into without having to really change much of my focus, but still sort of change the way that it was impacting the population potentially. So Marcus has the UAB Center for Exercise Medicine, which he had developed over the course of about 20 years. And it was a great opportunity to, to sort of walk right into that. They had a program at the time that was funded by the NIH that was called the T32 program. So just an opportunity for trainees to get their feet under them as researchers and work towards independence. And so there was a position available in his lab on the T32, and that was offered to me. So I moved down to Birmingham and took up my postdoc with him, where I stayed for about four years and then came down here. Yes, that does sound like a great opportunity. And Marcus Bauman uh, recruited you to IHMC. Marcus is here now, of course. And I think the UAB experience had to be really a growth opportunity and uh, a rich experience in many ways. 
Absolutely. I think that's always been sort of what I've been trying to work towards. You know, every opportunity should be a growth opportunity from the previous one. If you're ever not growing, that's not a good sign, right? For sure. That's true. So um, absolutely. I think that um, Marcus saw the value in that too. A lot of times as a postdoc, there would be an objective of a postdoc bringing something new to the lab that could enrich the research that's happening there. So I was fortunate to have the opportunity to do that from a computational biology perspective. And what I mean by that is just really the use of computers to understand large-scale biological phenomena. So instead of asking questions in a really targeted way, a lot of the research that we were then able to do was sort of non-hypothesis driven, something to the effect of exercise is going to help with this and we'll, we'll tell you how, you know, and, and then we would just go out and, and look at everything. And that takes a lot of computational power. It takes a lot of specialized algorithms. And I had no idea what any of that looked like when I set foot at UAB. But over the time that I was there, was able to learn from a lot of really smart people, both on campus as well as collaborators offsite, and uh, start, sort of build an arsenal of tools for us as a lab that then I've been lucky enough to come down here and put into place with our ongoing work. So you've mentioned this, that you you became interested in neurodegenerative diseases and the idea that exercise could be a way to help manage or treat diseases and also perhaps prevent or even delay the onset of disease. And in 2017, a group at UAB that was led by Marcus Bauman published a study where researchers took people with Parkinson's and ran them through a high-intensity exercise program. And what they found was that you could not only help people preserve some function, but also restore some function. So can you talk about how you found this project so amazing and the potential application of exercise in this context? Oh, I think it's incredible to just conceptualize that. So not only are you potentially stalling the progression of a disease, but you're actually recovering some function. And it's something like Parkinson's that touches pretty much every part, every system in the body. That's just amazing to think that in four short months, you can do something like that. So I have a family history of dementia, as, as many of us probably do. It's kind of hard to imagine not, that not being the case. And so, of course, it's a great fear of mine that you know, I want to preserve my cognitive capacities as long as I can. And I want my mother to be able to do that. And I want my father to be able to do that. And I want everybody to be able to do that, frankly. And so if the answer is something as simple as exercise, then, you know, we should figure out why and we should try and enact that. And so I was really interested in neurodegenerative disease, of course, for those reasons. And, and Marcus just had this data set that was kind of just lying around. And I mean, that's a golden opportunity there. So We started to do this technique that's called RNA sequencing, which is a method of measuring every gene that is expressed in a tissue. And of course, this time we were looking at skeletal muscle. And in doing so, you don't limit your focus to one particular pathway or one particular outcome, but you're just looking at everything and you're comparing it. In this case, we were looking at pre-training to post-training in individuals with Parkinson's disease and seeing how that sort of reshaped the environment within their muscle. And what we found through using this really powerful technology was that in just four short weeks of this high-intensity regimen, it would actually restore some groups of genes within their muscle to look like older, healthy people that did not have Parkinson's, and sometimes like young people, in fact. So it's a really powerful rehabilitative mechanism. And it really opened the door to continuing to use this technology, first of all, to continue to build those data sets that would allow us to sort of map the exercise response, but also just start to understand how these whole body benefits were being seen, like increases in muscle size and increases in endurance and fatigability and the way they get around in their environment, which is really what it's all about, quality of life. Absolutely. And, you know, despite our awareness for a long time, for centuries, that Parkinson's disease has a negative impact on motor function, you know, that's quite obvious. Right. There's been very little attention really paid to the impact Parkinson's has on skeletal muscle. And, you know, could you talk a little more about that and about your study? And, you know, you probably developed insight into potential mechanistic roles of skeletal muscle as it relates to disease and health in this context. That's very true. Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative motor disease, but so often we focus on the brain because that's the site of the problem. There's an area of the brain wherein neurons are known to die. And so a lot of the time you don't see really symptoms manifesting until those neurons have died. So the idea would be if you can cut the problem at that point, then you'll never see them develop. But unfortunately, 
in reality, you don't know the problem exists until the symptoms are there. So with Marcus's work, they had done this small pilot in about 30 individuals. Maybe it was even less than that, something like 20 or 30 individuals undergoing this high-intensity program to target muscle in a way that you might not necessarily think was best for that disease. And it was it looked like high-intensity exercise, which I mean high-intensity. And the idea being that, you know, the higher, the heavier the load, the higher the intensity, the faster the speed, it requires more of the muscle to be engaged. And so, you know, the what Don and I were talking about, our happy place being the low intensity, go for hours and not worry about anything. There's a lot that's not being engaged when that happens. So that's when you need to apply a heavier load to do something different. And in the case of this Parkinson's disease trial, that's exactly what was done. They designed this really unique model that tested every major muscle group and used superset exercises. So instead of taking a rest while you're not doing your leg press, you get on the ground and do some push-ups or something like that. And the whole thing went on for about 45 minutes, three times a week. And it, by the fact that you're not resting, you provide the cardiovascular stimulus too. So it's a really unique model. And the individuals with PD that were part of those trials have always been fantastic participants. They're really invested in getting better, you know, and doing what they can. And so they rise to the occasion, and it's really great to see. And then we see the, the benefits in terms of the skeletal muscle response at the molecular level all the way up to the way that they can sit up and stand up from a chair. That had to be um, both amazing and sort of heartwarming. Completely. Mm-hmm. So, Kaylee, this is all just fascinating research. And just a note for our audience, this research was summarized in the paper titled Rehabilitative Impact of Exercise Training on Human Skeletal Muscle Transcriptional Programs in Parkinson's Disease, and that was published in the Frontiers of Physiology. And we'll make sure to provide a link for that in the show notes. As you mentioned earlier, Kayleen, in your analysis of that 2017 data set, you mentioned that you were able to identify 706 genes that were differentially expressed after rehabilitative training. And, uh, you know, we see that in other kinds of environments like space. You know, in space, you see a marked shift in gene expression. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how this work that you did strengthens our understanding of skeletal muscle as a communicative tissue? You know, one often doesn't think of skeletal muscle playing that role. And uh, could you discuss that a little bit? That's a great point. I think we think muscle helps us get around and that's all it does but it's more than just the meat hanging off of our bones. It's doing so much. And what we found in that study helped us appreciate the way that muscle communicates with the brain. And the way that the brain communicates with the muscle, frankly, there's a lot of crosstalk between those tissues. We know they make a physical connection at a point called the neuromuscular junction, where there's actually an axon from the brain that is making contact with the muscle. That's how we get muscle to contract, of course. And so there's adaptation that can occur there as that as those jun- junctions are strengthened, as they gain integrity, as they maybe change dynamically over time. They're challenged with unloading. Like you mentioned, going to space is a huge unloading challenge. And um, we really don't have a, a lot of appreciation for the mechanism of how those dynamics change over time. But I think PD is a great model because we do see that it's possible to not only rescue those connections, but to to strengthen them. And so it's really amazing. We're continuing to understand how muscle fits in with the other tissues of the body and how it talks to them. And we're continuing to do that here with some of our ongoing work. So Kayleen, you ended your paper talking about how future research is needed to to determine the influence of exercise training on other levels of phenotypes in Parkinson's disease, and also how skeletal muscle may reflect or orchestrate these changes. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Of course. I think muscle is the target of exercise, right? That's usually what we're thinking about that muscle is the primary mover when you engage in an exercise program. And so it's natural to imagine that that is where those changes would be initiated from. Muscle, as as Ken mentioned, is a really communicative organ. It can release things into its environment. It can sort of package up molecules and send them out, and then they might make contact with another body tissue, and they might initiate change there. And one of the ways that it does this is with small molecules called microRNAs. And so we're, we have a project designed now. I'm working on a data set in Parkinson's disease, on individuals who have undergone the same exact program that we just talked about in order to understand if 
these circulating microRNAs might be helping the muscle talk to the brain, the brain talk to the gut, or whatever, right? Whatever direction of communication. Understanding what it looks like can help us make it better for the greatest number of people, can maybe help us identify how we can combine exercise with another type of therapy to make the best benefits possible and what that therapy might look like a drug or it might look like another type of wellness um, activity like mindfulness, meditation, yoga, whatever. I think that if we know what the these connections look like and we can sort of map them out, it's going to make it a lot more possible to intervene in a way that is effective rather than just kind of taking a shot in the dark, which mm. is not what we've done so far, but but it's, it's creating a more enriched map by looking this way. Mm. That uh, discussion uh, seems to lead into a possible plan for a future clinical trial on Parkinson's here at IHMC. Are you thinking about that? Yes. Uh, Dr. Zachary Graham, who came down from UAV with us as well and is is currently appointed here as well as the Birmingham VA, and myself just uh, put together a project that we are really hoping takes off in individuals with Parkinson's disease. And what we'd like to do there is really maximize the potential of exercise as an intervention that helps the greatest number of people. What I mean by that is we, if you take somebody and then put them through an exercise regimen, you can't expect them to have the same benefits as the person next to them. You always see heterogeneity. You mm. always see different responses. And sometimes people don't do well at all. Sometimes they actually lose muscle mass if they undergo an exercise training regimen. And we don't really know why. And um, we see the same thing with no matter what you're looking at, whether it's muscle mass or speed or strength or endurance or whatever. So we want to be able to enhance the way that people with Parkinson's disease might respond to an exercise training regimen. And so Zach and I are looking forward to continuing that work here at IHMC. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Thank you. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. So, Kayleen, after working on the impact that a high-intensity exercise program can have on people with Parkinson's, you embarked on a study that looked at why some people gain muscle and some people don't, as you just mentioned. And after the age of 30, skeletal muscle mass decreases at a rate of 3 to 8% per decade, and that rate of loss accelerates even more after the age of 65. So it would be great if you could give our listeners some perspective on why the reduction in skeletal muscle mass with advancing age is, is such a serious issue. And we've kind of talked about that already, but if you could expand on that, that'd be great. Right. It's absolutely an issue, not only for having muscle mass to get around in your world and having muscle to be, you know, communicating with the rest of the body, as we talked about a little bit, but it's the major source of glucose disposal. So a lot of conditions like type 2 diabetes and other metabolic syndrome disorders could benefit from having a healthier skeletal muscle mass available because of the way that it, it's engaged with, you know, with the rest of the body and glucose management. But I think a big thing that really has come to light in the public health mindscape recently is the role that muscle plays in the immune response. So I don't know if you remember a few years ago when the pandemic first had started, there was a, a nurse somewhere in the Midwest who posted a picture of himself before versus after being contracted with COVID. And he had lost tons of muscle mass. I mean, he was almost frail. And this is a young person, a young, relatively healthy person. And it just makes you wonder, right, why, why was muscle the thing that the body gave up when it was faced with that immune challenge? And I think that the reason is because muscle is where all the protein is. So if you have to mount an immune response, create antibodies, and meet mm -hmm. the challenge, you take muscle apart. And it's metabolically expensive. Yes, absolutely. And so if you're not, if you don't have a healthy muscle mass to begin with, for example, if you're a frail elderly individual, you don't have that repertoire to pull from. So I think having muscle mass available, especially as we age, is, is really, really important because it helps you be ready for something like that. Agreed. And, you know, one hears about sarcopenia and it's often depicted as, you know, a slow multi-decadal decline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it kind of is, but that slow s sort of loss of muscle starting, as you mentioned, at an early age 
has typically has spikes, big downward drops that are caused by disease or illness or inactivity. Mm-hmm. You know, so in a, an older person, they've lived long enough that they will have experienced some of these. And if they don't have a reserve, as you mentioned, these losses are tremendous. You know, you'll go through cancer or you'll go through some other illness and experience a steep, almost straight down decline, as opposed to sort of the nice gradual decline that that we think of when we think of aging. Right. Right. And of course, I think that, you know, we want people to have a good quality of life. I think that's really the number one outcome in, in anything. And so being met with a challenge like that and losing so much muscle mass, sure, it might mean that it affects a little bit of the way you go through and perform your activities daily life. But the bigger picture is that that's going to make it, it more challenging for you to to do a lot of things that are enriching to your life. Absolutely. And the loss of independence yes. is often related to loss of muscle. You know, in, in my own family, I have a relative who, the reason he lost his independence wasn't that he wasn't generally healthy for 93 years old. He certainly was, but he really had lost enough muscle that his independence was uh, soon not viable. Right. That makes sense. So you've examined what happens at the molecular level that might shed light on the impact of resistance training on muscle hypertrophy. And previously, the UAB lab, as well as other labs around the country, had demonstrated that the magnitude of resistance training induced muscle hypertrophy is highly variable. And you mentioned this earlier. It's highly variable across individuals. And this phenomenon is sometimes called inter-individual response heterogeneity. So how are you hoping to expand upon this? And what have you learned about that in the context of the study from a molecular perspective? It's really interesting. From a molecular perspective, there are sort of profiles that help us understand why people might respond poorly. So they end up on the low end of muscle mass gained when all is said and done. And those are the ones that I think that they need some kind of help. And I think in some cases, it might be that they need more exercise. And in some cases, it might be that they need less. It might be too much of a burden for them to bear. And some of the work that Marcus has done looks at the levels of inflammation within individuals that respond poorly. And the idea is they've got a big inflammatory burden. And sometimes that has to be overcome with more exercise. And sometimes it has to be overcome with less or sort of avoided with less. So it's really nuanced. But I think that by profiling it at the molecular level, by looking at gene expression and looking at other levels of communication that that might be danger signals or stress signals from the muscle, we can get an idea of who can benefit most from what. And that really gets to the idea of uh, precision medicine, which is exactly what we do in the pharmaceutical sphere. You certainly won't give the same prescription to an individual given their genetic background or whatever other factors might be important. We need to work towards the same thing for exercise in order for it to be the best for that person. That makes perfect sense. And you can see that not just in in the general population, but you see the various response to exercise and kinds of exercise also in athletic populations. Mm-hmm. Right. So, Kayleen, you have this, what seems to be a unique approach in that you use two algorithms to assess the evidence of gene networks that link muscle building to gene expression at baseline and then and then track its change over time. So how did you arrive at the decision to proceed this way and what future research possibilities does it open up using these approaches? Some of the algorithms that are available help us reduce the burden of looking at all these outcomes. Some of these studies will often look at tens of thousands of genes, and it's just impossible to interpret those, right? So we need a tool that's good at it, and and IHMC is really a great place to be to leverage our capacity to summarize data like that and to make it make more sense. So in in the case that you just mentioned, Don, we had used two algorithms that did exactly that. They help us create what we call molecular networks that are just based on patterns and data. They might be only math-based, which is what one of our approaches in that paper looked at, was using just math, uh, gene-by-gene correlations to create little networks that we assume reflect how genes sort of talk to one another or move together over time in response to stress, which whether that's exercise or aging or combination of both. And then there are other algorithms that actually bring in information that is publicly available that help us. So we might know a group of genes is involved in a pathway. Well, we can use that information to help the algorithm look for those patterns rather than doing completely agnostically. 
So we thought there was value in both of those approaches, and uh, we thought it might be a good idea to run them in parallel and then see if they were giving us the same thing, assuming that these completely divergent approaches on the same data set, if we did find any overlap, then that would be a sort of truer biology than looking at any one by itself. And what we're hoping to do here is to build on those algorithms even further to increase their interpretive capacity and make it less prone to error and less prone to human decisions, which, as we all know, can be highly biased. Yes, I know that um, some of the AI machine learning researchers here very much like the collaboration with you, and I'm uh, pleased about that, and I think it's a good thing. It's often said in lay terms that exercise confers lifelong benefits, and I think we all believe that. Your study leaves open the possibility, though, that exercising in the past leaves a kind of footprint, maybe a molecular footprint, creating a sort of muscle memory that could come back later and kind of help us as we age when we re-engage in exercise, even if we haven't kept up the habit of exercise throughout our life, as we, of course, should. Can you share more about this finding and what questions this leaves open for further research? This seems like just teeing up research questions for the future. I completely agree with that. I think this was a really interesting study to be able to do. And I think you're referring to the lifelong exercisers study. This was um, my dissertation while I was at Ball State, but it was really part of a larger project that Scott Trappy had developed to look at individuals who were exercisers for as many decades as they could basically control what they were doing. So as soon as they became young adults, they started exercise and then it became part of their life. And as you said, Ken, it, it's not always the number one priority. You have family, you have life, you have job changes, moving and, and things like that. And so exercise might fade into the background, but it's still there. And I think that these lifelong exercisers were a great example of that because it was enough of a priority of them to build their lives while exercise was also there, if that makes sense. So they were, at this time that we sampled them, they were around 75 years old, but the majority of them had been training in some capacity for the last 50 years. And, um, you know, my dad is a great example of that. He's, he's too young right now, only being 62, but he would have been a great candidate for the Lifelong Exercise Project, I think. So maybe in a, a decade or two, if they're still doing it. <laughs> but, but really, what you saw was that it wasn't consistent. The, the number of miles that they could ride their bike or that they could run on a decade to decade basis was highly variable, but that's what it looks like in reality. It's not a highly controlled research project where everybody does the same highly regimented supervised thing. So there was a lot of uh, validity, I think, in that it was sort of like a free living thing. Everybody did their best to remember what they were doing 30 or 40 years ago. And to be honest, a lot of these people have really detailed records because it's that important to them. So they keep track of everything they do. But we sort of found that it fell out into two groups. There was a group of people that were lifelong exercisers with the objective being competition. They were really performance focused. And the, these are the guys who have the notebook of here's the races I did. And here's where I placed. And this is my dad, too. And uh, they, you know, they want to know everything about their performance because that's the outcome for them. And then there was another group that were really just kind of focused on fitness. They might have been exercising just for themselves. You know, I think I fall more into this group, but they were still doing it for their entire lives. So we have these two sort of clusters of lifelong exercisers, these performance and these fitness focused people both males and females. And this study was really fascinating because it, it just sampled them at a moment in time. So we, we took their histories, their training histories, which were quite detailed as valid. You know, they're self-reported, but they're as good as we're going to get because we're not tracking them for 50 years. And we just compared these people to age-matched individuals who didn't have histories like that. So we called them our old healthy group. And, and they were really that. I mean, that's not giving them enough credit, frankly. In Muncie, Indiana, which is very much a farm town, a lot of these people grew up and lived their lives on farms, which is a pretty rigorous physical activity, honestly. And most of them didn't make it to that age by sitting around. So they were far from sedentary. A lot of them engaged in less structured exercise activities like golf and gardening and, and things like that. But nevertheless, we're still pretty active. But based on our restrictions, which were you couldn't be on too many medications and and you couldn't be obese and, and things like that. It made that population really, really hard to find. So I guess the, the one takeaway from that study is you don't make it to a healthy age 75 without doing something, hmm. uh, which was really valuable to learn. Did any of the findings sort of jump out as a surprise? Yes, I think that 
Uh, so as I mentioned, we had men and women, and we looked at them in two separate categories. So we weren't statistically powered to investigate a sex effect, which is not really the best way to do it. But I think that we still get some insight into what might be going on. So I'll just say as a caveat that this was not a statistically investigated sex effect. But we did look at the males and found that those that were lifelong trained were sort of better prepared molecularly to handle an unaccustomed exercise stress. So basically, these are lifelong cyclists, lifelong runners. We make them lift weights. I can tell you that's not a fun thing <laughs> to, to have to do if that's not the thing that you like to do. So it's definitely a molecular stress. But what it looked like within the muscle of those individuals was that they sort of handled it better than the people who weren't mm -hmm. exercising regularly. That was true in the males, but it wasn't true in the females. Um, and in fact, they looked really similar to older, untrained, age-matched women as opposed to younger women that that we assume is the the model of how you would want to respond, right? We use them as sort of the reference point and assume if it's changed since then, it's gotten worse. So I think that opened a lot of doors as to why that's happening in muscle. There's been some great work uh, from Colorado that has looked at it from a cardiovascular perspective, the, the phenomenon of aging in, in females that are lifelong exercise trained. And it does seem like there's a lot to be said for the menopause transition and what goes on there and mm -hmm. the, you know, the endocrine burden that how everything just completely changes physiologically when you undergo that. So I think there's a lot of work to be done to understand how we can preserve health and exercise performance as well as just overall um, everything that goes with it really in women as they age and undergo mm -hmm. menopause. You mentioned yeah. several really interesting things there, both the sex difference, but also that the nature of the exercise, we tend to do the kind of exercise that we enjoy. Absolutely. And so, you know, this becomes a problem as, especially as we age, you know, I, I'm 67 and a lot of my friends are in their mid seventies and early seventies. And, uh, some of them are avid runners or avid cyclists and they're lean and thin, mm -hmm. uh, but very weak and, uh, have lost a lot of muscle mass and, uh, often are pre-diabetic and, uh, they really hate lifting weights, right? And so uh, I encourage them to do that, and it's like encouraging me to run, right? It's, <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> they don't like it. And uh, somehow I'm hoping that, right. that there's a, uh, as researchers learn more, that there could be very focused precision sort of medicine prescriptions, almost like a prescription that your physician gives you for exercise and that people will actually do it. I, I think that's a real challenge. I totally agree with you. That is, in my mind, the biggest challenge for us as exercise researchers is how do we make it matter? Even as you said, people that are highly invested in their health and their performance still don't really want to do what they know they should do. And I think that it goes beyond what we do as molecular biologists to figure out the answer to that question. That's going to be something for the behavioral psychologists and really just, I think, personally on an individual level, sort of grappling with that. It's tough. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, injury prevention is a really good motivator. And um, so I, I do weightlifting and, and, you know, resistance exercise with the idea that this is going to make me stronger so that I don't get tired and get weak in those little muscles hours into the activity that I really want to do. Right. You know, um, and, and sometimes I get lazy, right? And uh, everything is going great. And so I don't really need to lift. And then something starts to hurt. And oh, yeah, no, I mm -hmm. really do. Right. So I, I, for me, I figured out that that needs to be how I motivate myself to do it. But I certainly don't, I'm not perfect at it. In some of my age group, you know, endurance athlete friends, they found the DEXA scan. Uh, very motivating oh. because it's subjective, you know, <laughs> yes, uh, they hop on there and they're, they're lean and gets on the DEXA scan. And when he sees the result, he's stunned. Right. And <laughs> uh, I think that can be very motivating. And in terms of aerobic exercise, what I found motivating was you know, I live part of the year in Wyoming and it's very, very steep. And the house oh. is at 7,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I huff and puff going up oh, and down the hills. Yeah. And so I realized, wow, I, I, I should work more on this so I can enjoy this beautiful place more. That's a great point. I, you know, environment and, and s social reasons, I think, are a great reason to exercise, too. For people that might not enjoy lifting weights, maybe doing it with a friend, right? People mm -hmm. that don't like biking, having somebody with you and you talk to pass the time. And, and that 
activates a whole another part of the brain, right? So now we're bringing in psychology, and I think that that's enriching because we already know the brain and the muscle are talking to each other. So why not just do it all at once? I agree. So, Kayleen, the study supports other recent evidence that training is anti-inflammatory and that the lifelong habit of exercise offers protection against what we're going to call inflammaging, which is what happens when someone experiences chronic, low-grade inflammation throughout the aging process. But building an exercise habit takes time and focus, as we've been talking about. And for people who may have waited until our 30s or 40s to begin that habit, have they really wasted their window of opportunity to benefit from that protective therapeutic factor that regular training confers? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's ever too late, honestly. There's some evidence that when you get up around 80, it becomes really challenging to overcome. And of course, as you age, you might start bringing on more comorbidities that make it harder to get these adaptations as easily. But I think as a general statement, no, I don't think it's ever too late. Um, Certainly not to try and, and step in, right? Anything that you can do to to refer to Ken's point earlier, to flatten that slope of decline, do it. Whether that might be resistance exercise or endurance exercise or diet or something unconventional like a CrossFit type exercise, combined training, whatever is the thing that you're going to do, I think, I think it's good. Mm -hmm. So you recently were the lead author of a paper that appeared earlier this year in Comprehensive Physiology, and it's titled State of Knowledge on Molecular Adaptations to Exercise in Humans. And so this paper was a a comprehensive look at the current literature that surrounds the molecular and cellular processes that underlie exercise-induced benefits and also adaptations in humans. And the paper also had a a bit of a forward spin in identifying areas that warranted future research efforts. But before we talk about this paper, um, we'd love it if you could set the stage for listeners and explain how the study of exercise as a preventative and therapeutic treatment has been rapidly gaining momentum for the past couple of decades, which which is great to hear. It is. Um, It's really interesting to think that this field would not have really been, it certainly would not have been as molecularly focused as it is right now, a couple of decades ago. But it really did grow with the, the field of medicine itself. So we've known exercise is good. Um, Exercise, just physical activity, right? Movement is good. We've known that since, since we've been caring at all about health. And that goes way back, uh, certainly beyond the age of the ancient Greeks and, and early civilizations appreciated that. And in putting this paper together, we had a really cool opportunity to go back and, and read some of what these early philosophers were saying and how there was the idea of this perfect medium level of activity that was enough to be beneficial, but not too much to be harmful. So that was really interesting to see how that all came to be. And really, as the field of medicine grew, as we became thinking more about body systems, exercise started to be understood from a body systems perspective. And as we started to think more about tissues and cells, exercise did the same thing. And now where we're in sort of the genome era, you know, the molecular level era, that's how we're thinking about exercise too. So as we appreciate health and medicine, you know, exercise is always right there too, because it is probably the best medicine. It's the most natural one and it's got no real side effects. So one of the reasons that you did this paper was because the NIH decided to fund a trial to look at the effect of exercise at the molecular level across a large group of people who are trying to build what they're calling the molecular map of exercise. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about the consortium that NIH is funding for this trial and also how your paper ties into that trial specifically? This was a trial that was designed by the NIH Common Fund. So the director of the NIH Dr. Francis Collins, who was involved in the Human Genome Project back at the turn of the century, decided and thought that exercise biology was worth putting this special pot of money towards in order to to figure it out, to, to try and, as you said, create the molecular map. The idea being, once you know the map, then you know where to go. You know what to target and you know how you can help people. And so this project was called MotorPack, and that stands for the Molecular Transducers of Physical Activity Consortium. This was a nationwide effort to try and profile the molecular responses to acute and chronic exercise in trained and untrained people. And the idea was to make it nationwide so that we could sample different geographical populations. And this all actually started to be talked about while I was still a doctoral student at Ball State. 
my advisor, Todd Trappy and his brother, Scott, who was the director of the Human Performance Lab, were collaborators with Marcus Bauman, who I later, of course, did my postdoc with, and Dr. Brett Goodpaster, who was down in Orlando, Florida. And the four of them put together one of the clinical analysis sites for the Motor Pack Consortium. They actually had the highest ranked application, I believe, of everybody that applied to be a, a clinical site. So they really put together a great model. And over the course of the time that I was at Ball State and then transitioned to doing my postdoc, this consortium started to take shape. We started to establish the procedures for sample collection and for training and for um, even analysis of the data itself. And so it was really neat, even though I wasn't directly involved with that, just to see how it all sort of came to be and to appreciate how wide reaching the potential of that study could really be. So when I got down to UAB, Dr. Thomas Buford, who is the, the senior author on this review that you're referring to, Don, had the idea of, okay, if Motor Pack is going to be really as impactful as we all want to imagine it's going to be, we're going to want to put a timestamp on where we stand before so that we can say, in the wake of Motor Pack, this is how far we've come, you know, and sort of compare pre to post with regard to the literature and the state of knowledge. And so he had the idea to put together this review to establish where has the field come since it started? What do we know right now? What are our current tools? How can we help various diseases? And where do we think we should go? And so he commissioned me to be sort of the the student lead or the trainee lead or whatever you want to call it on this paper. So I was um, given the role of sort of assigning sections to people, bringing everybody together, synthesizing everything, and um, and putting it in, turning it into what you see now, which is this pretty cool resource that talks about the state of knowledge of the field. So MotorPack presented the opportunity, and, and I hope that it will be as rewarding as we all imagine it will be. But I think that even if not, the collaborations that have occurred as a result of MotorPack and the connections that we've been able to make with scientists in areas that we never would have thought about uh, will be really rewarding. Mm. Uh, one example of that is, you know, we're talking to people who are next generation sequencing experts who use insanely complex computational algorithms that we didn't even really know about five or six years ago. And they're talking to us and we're speaking each other's languages now, which is really cool. Huh. This is a really nice review paper. And uh, I read a Thank lot you. of review papers. This is a good one. And <laughs> Thanks. You must be quite proud of it, frankly. What kind of response has it uh, had from the broader community? I think that it's being relatively well received. I think time will tell. Of course, reviews like this get downloaded and people look at the figures and then, you know, move on. Uh, but, but we did, we really pulled together a lot of resources to create it. And I think we cited something on the order of 1,400 or 1,500 papers just to put it together. And so Jeremy McAdam, who's here at IHMC, really did a great job pulling together all those references and making it actually possible for us to cite that many papers. And so he's our data management expert here. And I think that was a great example of his skills at work. That's a lot of stuff to manage in a citation manager. So he did a for great sure. job for us. Yeah, it was an <clears throat> impressive review, quite exhaustive and thorough. And uh, I think everybody that reads it will appreciate that. Speaking of the future of exercise science, we've been talking about that today. This is probably a good time to talk about some of your other work here at IHMC. Mm -hmm. Marcus, who is helping spearhead our health span resilience and performance research area, recruited you to become part of this initiative. But from your perspective, I understand why Marcus recruited you. It's, it's completely self-evident to me. But uh, from your perspective, what attracted you to this project and led you to decide to come to IHMC? I think that this sort of felt like an open slate. It felt like there was a lot of, it, it was obvious to me, I think, how we could fit in without disrupting what was already being done here, but actually enriching it. So Ken, you mentioned earlier bringing together the AI that is so well developed here and using it to enhance some of what we're doing on the health span resilience and performance side or the HRP side. And we've already you know, been talking to robotics, which is another really well developed area of research here. And it becomes obvious that when you add a new thing, you know, it doesn't mean everything falls apart or everything can be elevated together. And I think that it seemed like a good opportunity to step in and help these fields kind of co-advance one another within this really well-developed 
highly intellectually stimulating environment. I think so, too. And we're glad you joined. Well, thank you. And so, Kayleen, at IHMC, you're heading up a lot of the computational work that's being done to understand at the molecular level why some people respond better to stress and exercise than others, and why some people are more resilient than others. And in particular, you're heading up the molecular mapping for several projects, so that includes the oxytocin trial, Peerless, and Fight. And for all these projects, you're leveraging a grant you received to improve your ability to interpret large molecular data sets. So can you talk a little bit about these projects each, and then also how your work in this grant plays into each of them? Sure. I'll start by talking about the FIGHT project because that one is the oldest standing and we brought that with us from UAB. But this was a study that was, it's it's sort of like Motorpack in that we're looking at uh, molecular mapping. We're trying, all these, as you said, are sort of built around creating these molecular maps. But this was looking at young, healthy, college-age students and trying to establish what the molecular map looks like as they undergo exercise over time. And in this case, we were looking at two different doses and looking to see, are they different from one another? And does it look different if you do it when you're untrained versus when you're trained and then after you've undergone detraining, right? So just really mapping everything and looking at these dynamics over time. So um, it's a really complex data set, and we've had lots of opportunities to learn new algorithms and new tools and work with really, really talented individuals at other sites. We built up a great relationship with a group out in Arizona that's called the Translational Genomics Institute, or TGen for short, and they've been fantastic collaborators on Fight as well as Peerless and uh, some of the other ongoing work that we've got. Peerless is similar in regard to that we're molecular mapping, but in this case, we're more concerned with military performance and uh, what allows somebody to attain elite operator status. But again, we're using a lot of the same tools, a lot of the same measurements, and really just asking the question differently. So the, the approach is the same, but the question is different. And it's the same thing for oxytocin, uh, wherein we're just looking at the effects of oxytocin administration on molecular phenotyping and the way individuals can handle stress um, over time. So, of course, having the right tools is really, really important when you're using them over and over again. And uh, I and and another researcher here on site, Arash Mayari, put together a proposal for a project to build up our algorithmic potential. And we are working on that now. It's a project called ePlier, which is, stands for Enhanced Pathway Level Information Extractor. It builds on the work of a group at Pittsburgh led by Maria Chikina and uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City, led by Stuart Sealfon and a tool that they have, which is called Plier. We, <laughs> we think we can enhance it. We think we can make it better. And in doing so, we hope to be able to benefit all of these projects because, as I mentioned, they're all using this tool. What we want to be able to do is allow it to handle higher dimensions of data as our research questions get more complicated, we add more groups, we add more time points, we add more body tissues. Everything is increasingly statistically complex. So we need the right tools. And Arash is a genius um, with regard to the way that he can model these things and make them incredibly complex you know, concepts make sense to me as we talk through it. And then my biological perspective, I suppose, is useful in that uh, you know, we have to tie it back to function and performance at, at some level. And so that's that's the small role I can play in this project, but it's been really exciting so far. That's awesome. So last year, you gave a presentation at IHMC about a paper that appeared in Scientific Reports titled High Intensity Leg Cycling Alters the Molecular Response to Resistance Exercise in the Arm Muscles. And the paper was by a group of researchers out of the Swedish School of Sport and Health Sciences in Stockholm. And it examined acute molecular responses to concurrent exercise involving different muscles. And the researchers found that leg cycling prior to arm resistance exercises caused systemic changes that potentiate induction of specific genes in the triceps without compromising the anabolic response, which is which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So you can, can you talk about the significance of this paper, which has attracted quite a bit of attention since it was published in 2021? Well, that's good to hear that it's receiving attention. I think it absolutely deserves it. As you mentioned, it's it's really just bringing different types of exercise together, right? There's an idea that there's this sort of interference effect. And I think that's part of why we think if I, you know, if I lift weights, I'm going to get too big and then I won't be able to carry all that muscle mass on my bike or whatever, right? And if you, if you bike, then you're going to get too frail or whatever. The idea is you're gonna, they're going to facilitate different adaptations that get in the way of what you actually want to do. There's this longstanding idea and that's called the interference effect. And um, 
This paper just goes to show that that's not really true. In fact, it might even be beneficial to engage in both, which is great because we really should be doing it because the adaptive differences or the adaptive outcomes are complementary, right? In reality, none of us are going to, unless you are a highly trained individual that is seeking one outcome, in reality, we want all those benefits. We want strength and we want endurance and we want reduced fatigability and we want muscle mass and all those things, right? So it, it, this paper was really cool because it goes to show that you, you can do one type of exercise. And in fact, I think in this case, they were doing cycling before arm weightlifting and seeing that you're not going to compromise the outcomes of one type of training just because you did something else before. And in fact, it might even augment it over time. They didn't look uh, chronically, so that's that's conjecture, but it, it would be really interesting to follow up and see if, if that was the case. As we discussed earlier, you love to run and you were an endurance swimmer, not a sprinter. Do you think your type of muscle fiber has anything to do with this? A little birdie told me that your muscle fiber is highly skewed toward type 1 fibers. Thus, in a sense, making you an ideal candidate for endurance running and other sort of endurance activities. How do you see that? I totally agree. We have a really cool opportunity here, as well as at UAB, as well as at Ball State and everywhere, that samples skeletal muscle and that you get to learn something about yourself at the molecular level. So you can you can assume when you're 15 years old and you can't sprint a 50-meter freestyle that, oh, you know, maybe I'm more of a slow twitch kind of person. You can make that assumption there. But um, when you actually see it on paper, there's no denying it. So when I was at, at Ball State, I underwent several muscle biopsies, often with the objective being so we could get practice tissue just to do some work. And, and then I was part of many studies too. And um, often we were looking at single fiber physiology and the mechanics of the way that fibers contract. And I was told that even my fast fibers were kind of slow. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then come to UAV and actually see a histological mount where we can take a snapshot of all the cells in the tissue and stain them based on their, their expression of myosin, which is the main contractile component. One of the main contractile components is skeletal muscle, and, and it dictates how it uses energy. And so, I don't know, something around the order of 90 or 95 percent of my muscle fibers in what should be a mixed muscle are slow. Wow. So wow. so if I'm not supposed to be doing long duration exercise, I don't know what I'm supposed well, to be doing. <laughs> well, I, I wonder how much of that is uh, genetic and yeah. how much of that is adaptation. You know, you see this in people that engage in endurance events. You know, there's a shift. Also in the aging population, which I find exceptionally interesting, you know, you see uh, a shift towards type one muscle as we age, the loss of the fast twitch muscle. And that, that strikes me as particularly interesting, you know, because you see a loss of power right. in older people, even if they maintain a lot of strength, uh, but power, explosive power seems to, to uh, leave first. That's right. The type two fibers or the fast twitch fibers are about five or six times more powerful on a single fiber level than the slow twitch. So you can imagine if as we age, those are the ones that are preferentially lost or preferentially undergo atrophy, then that's why the power is going away. But it's also why you often see individuals sort of that are more aerobically inclined, they start to do the longer duration events. They stop signing up for the 5Ks and they start signing up right. for the half marathons and the ultras because it's a lot more comfortable. But I think it also speaks to the idea, and we got to this a little bit earlier when we were talking about the Parkinson's disease trial, but if you put the right kind of stress on the muscle, you can hang on to those things. The high intensity exercise and the, and the really you know power focused moves necessitate there to be neural connections to those fast twitch fibers. And so if the objective is I wanna hang on to these, then we have an idea of how it can mm -hmm. be done. Also, in an earlier STEM talk, we had a couple episodes dealing with electrical muscle stimulation oh, okay. and the ability to strongly, obviously, activate fast twitch mm -hmm. muscles. <laughs> um, that, that was interesting as I well. I imagine, yeah. So, Kayleen, uh, the next question is, is there a triathlon in your future? I would love to do another triathlon. Um, oh, you've done one before. I've okay. done a couple a Olympic couple? duration ones. When I lived in Muncie, they're, they had one every month of the summer, so uh, I was able to do them pretty often. I got out of it a little bit when I was living in Birmingham just because of the sort of the layout of the land didn't make it as easy to get out on my bike. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I would love to. And, you know, the longer the better. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's funny. Most, <laughs> yeah. most people are hoping for a short one. Oh, no, yeah. no. I've got nothing to show for that. <laughs> well, this, especially with that muscle makeup. Right. So on, that, on that note, what are your overall thoughts about the influence of muscle fiber type on performance and how that might influence someone in terms of them gravitating towards a particular mm-hmm. mode of exercise? We've kind of talked about this a little bit, but do you think, um, I mean, maybe just that, that comfort factor too, like we were mm-hmm. talking about. Right. I think it's a mix of that. Um, you know, Ken mentioned that you sort of gravitate towards one. There could be a significant genetic component that allows that to happen. If you grow up in a house where that's the type of exercise mm-hmm. that you're doing, right? Then if you've got mm-hmm. the the parents that are signing you up for certain sports, right? And it's okay, okay I, I better get good at this because this is what I'm doing. Then, you know, that's going to cause some things to happen. But I do think that there's a level of plasticity that doesn't exist. You're not going to necessarily cause all your fiber type to shift in one direction just because it's what you do all the time. I think that when there's the stimulus for it, it to be, you know, kind of use it or lose it mentality is true to some degree, but I also don't think that it's completely adaptive. You know, I just happen to to look this way. I have no idea what my parents' fiber type is, but, you know, I can make a good guess, especially given the type of exercise that they both like to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, that makes sense. But it's really complex. And there's been some really, really interesting books written about this idea. A great one that I read recently is called The Sports Gene. And it goes into extreme detail about is it nature or nurture or is it genetics or is it training? And how come how come it's so different? How come it's so hard to figure out? And I think that's what keeps it really interesting from a molecular perspective, because those are really interesting things to think about, even if you're not worried about um, necessarily chronic disease or aging. If you're just thinking it from a performance and enjoyment standpoint, how can we make it more enjoyable for people? Because that's how they're going to do it. Yeah. So switching topics a little bit, <laughs> at the beginning of this interview, you talked about how much you love music and when you were youth and also how you sang in your high school chorus and choir. Mm-hmm. And I understand that you're still singing, but now in your church choir, is that correct? Yeah, um, here in Pensacola, fortunately, I have the opportunity to be part of a church choir. And I found that to be a really enriching thing to do. It's nice to be around like-minded people who enjoy music. So I like to have that as part of my life for sure. That's, a, That's awesome. a great compliment to a work life, right? Yeah, it is. And, and exercise as well. The uh, singing and other artistic expressions, I think, enrich us all. Agreed. Well, Kayleen, this has been a lot of fun. It's been awesome talking to you. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yes, Kayleen, it was great. Thank you very much. STEM Talk. 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 So that was such a fun conversation, and our conversation with Kayleen really enforces how powerful exercise is in terms of a person's health span and lifespan. But as Kayleen pointed out, it's frustrating that not enough people are taking advantage of all these physical and cognitive benefits that exercise bestows on us, and it's something that we can so readily do on a daily basis. Absolutely, and and it is pretty frustrating, Don, because as you said, there's so much research that backs up the powerful impact of regular exercise. Kayleen is really doing fascinating work across a broad range of topics. It's going to be fun watching her develop as a scientist here at IHMC. She certainly has been a great addition to our team. Absolutely. And if you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at stemtalk.us. This is Don Cornega signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.